The reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verses 13 to 20, and then on to chapter 8. And you'll find that on page 1204 in your church Bible. 1204. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 13. The certainty of God's promise. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. But because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus who went before us has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And now Hebrews chapter eight, verse one. The point of what we are saying is this, We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build a tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But the ministry of Jesus has received, that Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one, and it is founded on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them up out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks very much, Ruth. Potholes are the bane of my life at the moment. 
I've been doing quite a lot of driving lately, and as any local driver will know, at this time of year, two things happen. First, wintry weather opens up potholes on our roads. And second, the end of the financial year means the council spends all of its remaining road budget fixing them. So it feels like every road locally is either a minefield or it is at a complete standstill. In Woking, it feels like the traffic disruption follows you around the town, like the eyes of the Mona Lisa follow you around the room. Or oh, don't go through Horsell today. Or oh, whatever you do, don't go through St John's. No, I ah, caught you out, you went through Nap Hill, didn't you? It is Vision Sunday today, our annual chance to talk about who we are at St Mary of Bethany and where we are in our church's life. And there's a consistent picture which the Holy Spirit has been giving to people at this church over the last year and a half or so. A garden which has been dug over during the winter, where seeds have been sown and the spring is coming. There are green shoots appearing. It is a time of possibility, a time where God is just getting us ready and in the right shape but we're not there yet, it's still cold and wet outside. The flowers aren't yet in bloom. It is the time of year when there are potholes in the road. These can be challenging, painful, and can play havoc with your suspension. With all this in mind, this morning we're just gonna think about two things from that passage which Ruth read for us in Hebrews 6 and 8, page 1204 in the Bibles in front of you. God's hope is an anchor for the soul, and God promises to transform his people. That's where we're going this morning. So God's hope is an anchor for the soul. So on page 1204, chapter 6, verse 13 says this. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Now, remember Abraham's story? Called age 75, his son Isaac born to him 24 years later. So if you're under 99, look forward to that new baby arriving in your house. 24 years from promise to fulfillment. God promised Abraham blessing and descendants. And the writer to the Hebrews says, verse 17, God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his promise very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. So friends, the promise of blessing for Abraham's descendants is unchangeable. And the writer is telling us that today, everyone who trusts in Jesus is one of Abraham's spiritual descendants. And don't miss the fact that Abraham waited patiently. 24 years is a long time to wait. Since my period of leave, sort of 18 months ago, I've been doing a lot of thinking about waiting. Waiting is fundamental to the experience of Christians. And this period of Lent calls us to wait for God in desert places. But our culture finds waiting almost intolerable. I struggle to wait for my coffee to get made or to get a package I've ordered to arrive. Can I stand in a queue without getting my phone out? That's my challenge for Lent. We live in an era of box sets and streaming. You know, do you, you never have to wait for the next episode, except when you do, they catch you out, don't they? This culture of instant gratification can feed an impatience in your walk with Jesus. People walk away from faith disappointed with God or with other Christians when what they needed to do was wait. 
right now in our church life, we are advertising for some new staff. We're waiting for them. This week we've advertised for a new associate vicar. We are looking for a young people's and families coordinator. We don't know who God's going to send us or when they're going to arrive. We don't know exactly what gifts or skills or experiences they will have. So we need to pray them in. Pray urgently and repeatedly, brothers and sisters, because God isn't just in the destination. It's not, there isn't some mythical moment in church life where it's all going to be okay when these people arrive. God is in the waiting. In, as we experience those green shoots among our children, our young people, our fantastic teams, new people serving and coming through. Fantastic to have three singers up at the front this morning. We trust God for more musicians to renew our musical worship. And yet in our weakness, many of us are experiencing the Holy Spirit week by week in our services. Friends, there is meaning in the waiting. Last year, I launched our St. Mary's values. We all talked a lot about the possible values we might have. So we are kind, valuing every person as a loved child of God. We are joyful, sharing fun and creativity. We are brave, walking together boldly through the joys and challenges of life. We are equipping, learning from God's word, discovering our spiritual gifts and deepening our prayer lives. And we are hospitable, ensuring that there is a space for everybody. Our values are a measuring rod for everything that we do. And that includes looking at your own life and the way you are. I love the saying that leadership is disappointing people at a rate that they can manage. Leadership is disappointing people at a rate that they can manage. So friends, if you're disappointed with me or with the leaders at this church, believe me, you're not alone. And sometimes I disappoint myself. Those are our values. As your leader, just like you, I am a sinner in need of a saviour. So I try and keep very short accounts in my life. I apologise and I do my best to make things right when I've gone wrong. And I try to show grace when I've been let down by my fellow believers. These are not easy things to do, and that is why it's important to be brave. And then these great words in chapter 6 and verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. What a great promise, an anchor for the soul. Now... Classical literature isn't always very easy to understand, but what sets the Bible apart is how relevant it is to life today. Because you and I know exactly what it means to have an anchor for the soul, don't we? There's a fantastic old hymn based on this verse which asks the question, will your anchor hold in the storms of life? Don't sing it along now. Uh, perhaps we'll have it in a future week. And that is a good question this Lent. If you are feeling buffeted by tough times, or if the challenging season we faced as a church felt a bit like a road with just one too many potholes, can you drop your anchor and hold fast in the storm? Maybe today God is calling some of you just to hold on to that anchor and weather the storm in your own life. God's hope is an anchor for the soul. That's our first thought. And then I've just got one more. God promises to transform his people. So over the page, chapter 8 and verse 6. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs, the high priests, as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. And, and it is founded on better promises. Christians have God's covenant sealed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here we see the fulfillment of the great promise which the writer to the Hebrews quotes from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, and that's in chapter 8 and verse 10. 
This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will write my laws in their minds. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. And right there is another promise for you and me. God's laws in our minds and in our hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. That is a promise for you and me. It is a promise of the Holy Spirit that all of us can know God from the least to the greatest. And it's that children's song which we're going to sing at the next service. It's you and 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 you. It's for everybody. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And that is a promise you can rely on, your sins forgiven. No matter who you are or what you've done, a route back to God. And that is our vision at St. Mary of Bethany. Because who are we? What's our vision statement? God's transforming people in our parish to love Jesus, to serve and tell others, and to be community. We trust in God's promise to transform people. I trust that, yes, my life might be in a mess, or I might do silly things sometimes, or things might go wrong, but I am a little bit better than that person I was yesterday because of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. We trust in God's promise to bring transformation in our church family. As we've done the difficult work of changing how we do things, it's been a time of turbulence, disruption, and potholes in life and faith. Winter is really difficult, but without it, there is no spring. And now we trust God for the green shoots. We pray and keep watering them, trusting God for growth and fruit in their season. And it is only God who brings those things. We develop pathways through our church life. We ask what next for families at Bethany Babes or at Friday Night Club and for seniors at Cameo. What next? How are they gonna get to know Jesus better? We make our all together services a jumping on point which anyone coming in can immediately engage with. Just church but a little bit easier for a lot of people. Looking at our warm space, which has just finished, we think about that space and what it could be and what we've learned, our vision for cafe space as we refurbish our building. Who might stay on after Bethany Babes to feed their children? What about a coffee after Cameo or an after-school drop-in? After our St Mary's Chill a couple of weeks ago, we reflect on how that event made the most of what we've got. We weren't trying to reach for something we didn't have. We've got space and people and resources. What might we do more regularly on a Sunday afternoon, given that that's a time that works for a lot of the young families we have connections with? Might we work towards having another go at messy church, but in this space? We trust in God's promise to transform people, to transform our church family. God is giving us what we need now in this season and not just in the middle distance when he sends us new staff. Our journey together is just as important as our destination. Because in fact, we're never gonna arrive at that destination this side of the new creation. The work of, God, of building God's kingdom is never finished until Jesus comes back. He is calling us to pray and to wait on him. In the five and a half years I've lived in Woking, we've been looking forward to a mythical future day when travel disruption will end and all the building in the center will be complete. Friends, that day is never coming. I'm sorry to tell you. 
But with God as our anchor, leaning into his promise of transformation, you can face a certain future as who? God's transforming people in our parish. Let's pray. Just take a moment in quiet and let the Holy Spirit work into your hearts those things which he's saying to you this morning. prayer for each of us from this passage. Lord Jesus, I pray for each person here. Put your laws in their mind and write them on their heart. May you be their God and may they be your person. May they know you and see your work in every part of their life. Be the anchor for their soul today and always. Amen. <laughs>